Hello, my name is Maria, and today I will tell you about some really great tools that we created to help people learn quantum computing. So earlier today you heard a lot about quantum computing, and you have to admit that it's a very exciting topic. Uh, there is also this idea of it being able to solve the problems that are impossible to solve now. So uh, this means that there are a lot of people there who really want to learn quantum computing. What can we do to teach them, to help them learn? The first step towards uh, teaching people is creating materials that they can use to uh, learn themselves on their own. So we all know that learning with a teacher is awesome. Uh, you can be guided, uh, you can have your questions answered, but not everybody has the luxury of having access to the mentor. In fact, I'm pretty sure that vast majority of people learning quantum computing these days are on their own. So we need to be able to help them. And there are a lot of materials on the internet that uh, cover quantum computing. I mean, it's 2019 after all. Uh, there are books, there are videos, um, but a lot of these materials have some disadvantages. First, um, if you're reading a book or you're uh, watching some videos, it's um, by definition passive learning. You uh, consume information, but you're not very engaged with it. Uh, there are resources that offer active learning, but there are very few of them. And really, you cannot uh, master a concept or an algorithm until you have uh, actually tried to apply it to solve a problem, to implement the algorithm. Uh, and it doesn't really matter if this is a quantum algorithm or a classical. Uh, that's why the courses on classical algorithms always have uh, written assignments, they have labs, they have ways to implement things to make sure that you have actually internalized them. Uh, second, uh, let's say you have found some exercises to practice on. For example, books. Books have exercises. But what if the book doesn't have the answers or hints? I have a very specific book in mind. It's the one which everybody recommends to people who start learning quantum computing. It has lovely exercises, but it doesn't have answers. So if you have uh, solved the exercise and you want to check if you're correct, or if you're stuck on an exercise and you need a hint. Well, congratulations, you're stuck. So what we are trying to do, we're trying to remedy those issues. We created a project called uh, Quantum Katas, uh, named after this practice used in martial arts. Uh, I heard from people who actually tried martial arts that it's a terrible name but I've never done it myself, so it works for me. So the katas are uh, sets of programming exercises uh, on quantum computing that you can do using Q-sharp. Each kata uh, offers a set of tasks of increasing complexity on one topic. Uh, the, uh, each task has to be solved by writing some code. So it's active learning. You try to do something actively. And the most important part is that the katas have testing framework, which takes your solution, uh, runs it, and evaluates it to figure out whether it's correct or not. So the katas implement all the principles of good learning. Uh, it's learning by doing, they give you immediate feedback, and there is increasing complexity of the tasks you attempt. Uh, there are also answers for the tasks in the code, so if you're stuck, you can go to see the answers and figure out what you have been doing wrong or in what direction you have to be thinking. Uh, the Katas project is only uh, about a year old. Uh, so far we have 17 Katas on different project, on different topics. They cover uh, a lot of topics that would usually be covered in an introduction to quantum computing materials. Uh, starting from the very, very basics, like the gates that are used in quantum computing, like teaching you to recognize the correct gate for the situation, to fairly advanced topics like Grover's algorithm. Uh, Bettina talked earlier today about Grover's algorithm, and it's actually my favorite example of what we can do uh, 
to teach people. Because it's one of the very famous algorithms in quantum computing. A lot of people have heard something about it. Usually it's something like, oh right, it's this algorithm that can speed up database search. Uh, that level of detail. But once you actually go in and try to implement it, and try to implement it to solve a certain problem, even a simple one, that's when you start to figure out how, how is it that it works, what are the things that nobody mentions, and trust me, there are things that books don't mention. And uh, kind of the more you play with it, the more you start to understand that maybe database search is not the best application for this algorithm. Uh, the katas are all open source and freely available, available for everybody to download, to learn themselves, to teach other people. Uh, in fact, uh, they're open source, so a lot of them were contributed by people outside of our team. And they are available online as Jupyter Notebooks. Now it's time for a demo. Well, I like to live dangerously. This is uh, the kata which uh, teaches you to solve problems with Grover's algorithm. I did mention that it's my favorite, right? So let's uh, take a look at how this works. Ah, okay, it doesn't. Um, minor technical malfunction. Now it does. Um, so uh, I'm running this locally. It's also available online, but I didn't want to run the risk of dropping internet connection or something exciting like this. Uh, so it's a Jupyter notebook. You see there are some instructions in the beginning on how to initialize the kata. Uh, basically it loads some packages that it will need to evaluate your solutions. And um, the, f the first part is uh, writing oracles for the problems that you're trying to solve. So what does a Grover algorithm do? Uh, basically, it's given an implementation of a function which uh, takes binary input and gives you binary output, zero or one, indicating whether this uh, input is the solution to the problem you're looking for or not. And the goal of Grover's algorithm is to find any input that will uh, produce the value of function equal to one. It's basically trying to reverse engineer the function without knowing what it is. So the most interesting thing about it is actually implementing this oracle that it uses. Because you cannot use the classical implementation of the function to, to get this speed up that Grover's algorithm gives you. You need to be clever and to describe the conditions on the input which will give you the answer, the answer that you're looking for. So uh, Boolean satisfiability problems are actually an excellent example of the problems that can be solved using Grover search because they map to this binary input, binary output really, really well. Binary input is just the values of the Boolean variables that you assign to the to the variables, and the output is the value of the function. So the easiest uh, example of a set instance that you can do is this one, the end expression of two variables. So you see that the first task gives you a, a very simple task. Uh, it describes the inputs to the uh, operations that you will implement. It tells you what the goal is, what the transformation uh, that, done, that is done by your code should be. Uh, in some tasks, it describes the return, if the, you, the operation has a return, but if this one is a transformation, so there is no need. And then there is a code cell in which you actually write your code. It gives you the signature of the uh, operations that you need to implement, and here you can write the code. I have, this, I have seen this task once or twice before. 
So I should be able to write some code for it and run it by executing the cell. Uh, executing the first cell takes a little bit of time, but after that it's much faster. Okay, it actually tells me that the code I wrote is incorrect. Purely for demonstration purposes, I assure you. Uh, so uh, this is actually a compilation error. It will also tell you if your solution is uh, can be compiled but is incorrect. And this one is actually fairly easy to uh, resolve. It's just a missing semicolon. And then we run this cell again. Suspense, success. So yes, I indeed know how to solve the first task. So after this, the second task offers a slightly more complicated task. Uh, it's an org formula, which is very similar to add, but in quantum, it, it takes a little more effort to solve. I could go on solving uh, these tasks um, just because we have a lot of time from cutting the previous talk short, but really I want to be conscious of lunch coming up soon. So let's just look through the tasks. So you see the next one is another example of the formula. Then we get to more complicated formulas in which you need to actually combine some of the pieces you have implemented earlier and use them as building blocks. And then fairly soon we get to the SAT problem itself. It gives you a definition of what is a SAT problem, how it can be represented. Then it explains to you how uh, this task gives you the input, how it is represented. Because representing SAT problem is you need to have, to have some data structure which represents it. And then on and on, and then we get to the full SAT problem with arbitrary number of clauses. Then the second part of the kata offers you to implement Grover's algorithm using the oracles which you have done in the first section. So this is one of the major principles of the katas. Uh, the next tasks build on the previous ones or they cover the topic from slightly different angle. But usually in the end of the kata, you need to be able to put everything you have learned together. And in the end, you have to implement the algorithm and see how it, see to make sure that it works, even if you don't know the number of uh, inputs to the um, the number of solutions uh, to the formula. Um, okay, uh, does anybody have any questions at this stage? Because in the second part I will be talking about something slightly different. Okay, excellent. Let me return to the presentation mode. Okay, we have already seen that, right? Okay, so uh, now that we looked at the tools that people can use to learn quantum computing on their own, uh, in the second part of my talk, uh, I will tell you about how we used the quantum cartas and other tools uh, to teach students quantum computing. And I will also tell you how you can get access to those ex excellent materials, just in case you want to teach somebody. So this winter we taught a course, Introduction to Quantum Computing, at University of Washington. Uh, Martin will tell you more about it after lunch. It was a major effort by a lot of people in the team. And it was a very interesting experience. Just, you know, to give you something to look forward to. Uh, and meanwhile, I'll give you an overview of the materials we created for it that we're happy to share with other teachers. Um, so here is an overview of course materials. Uh, basically, it was a 10 week long course. So we had uh, 17 lectures 
and we have slides from those lectures. We had uh, written assignments that come with the solutions. Uh, we had uh, six programming assignments, which I will be talking about in much more detail. We offered uh, a big subset of quantum katas as labs, so the material which students can use to learn uh, the actual programming necessary to do programming assignments before they continue to do programming assignments. And also there were final projects uh, which we offered that students do in teams. So we did uh, programming, uh, we did programming projects rather than final exams. But again, Martin will talk more about it. I shouldn't steal his spotlight. Uh, here is a brief uh, overview of what topics we covered in the lectures. Uh, you will see that these are topics that any introductory course on quantum computing will have. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this course had a lot more information than some of the courses will have. So it was a 10-week course and we packed it full. Uh, we had actually several universities already using these materials for teaching their courses. And one of uh, our partners uh, took these materials and they basically took a lot of these materials, which are more introductory except Fourier transformizing, which is a bit more advanced. And from this section, they only took short algorithm. And they made a great course. They didn't feel short on materials. Then uh, there are written assignments. Uh, they are uh, tasks based on theory and applications. They don't involve any programming. So basically it's a task which is given to you on paper and you return a write-up of it. It's also manually graded. Fortunately, I was not involved in grading them. Uh, there are four written assignments. Uh, they cover different uh, topics of the course. We gave approximately one assignment for two weeks. And then there are programming assignments. That's what really made the course stand out because uh, well, hands-on component is always very valuable and it's always done in normal computer science courses, but in quantum computing it's a bit harder to do, to do it. So the loveliest piece about it is that the tasks are automatically graded. Our teaching assistants loved me for it because, I mean, there are only so many times you can look at Q-sharp code for Grover's algorithm to grade it. And it's not a lot of times. So they are very similar to the katas. Uh, I will show them a bit later. And again, they cover uh, the same material, but they are designed to accompany the written assignments. For example, if you have a task about a circuit, like the one shown here, uh, it's really easier to just do it on paper. And if you, if you have a task, for example, about drawing a circuit, uh, it's, it's done on paper. But if you want to do something a different angle, programming assignments are ex excellent for that. So how we did it, we taught the lectures to introduce the theoretical material. Then we offered a cut or several on these topics for people to practice and internalize the topic. And then we followed it with a graded uh, programming assignment. Now it's time for another demo. Uh, I will show you the programming assignments themselves. So I go to here. Let me go here. Uh, just to continue the uh, trend I started with talking about Grover's algorithm, this is programming assignment from week four uh, in which we covered uh, Grover's algorithm. We also happened to cover uh, Fourier transform on that week. We had basically a snowpocalypse and it was a long week to cover. 
so you can see the structure of the project here. It's very similar to structure of the katas. You have the file with the tasks, you have the file with reference implementations, which you can see uh, just to check yourself how it is graded. Uh, and you have testing harnesses. The file with the tasks is similar to what Bettina showed us earlier, and this is how the katas look when they are in project mode as opposed to notebook mode. And this file is the only one that the students get when they get the homework. You see that it has a little introduction telling you what topics are covered and what katas uh, should be solved before attempting this material. And then we have the tasks. And again, they look very similar to the katas. They give you the inputs to the task, the output or the goal of the task, and the signature. And you have to write the code here. So basically, uh, how the workflow looks like, we give this file to the students. The students uh, work on it, uh, fill in the blank spaces, and at the end of the week, uh, once the assignment is due, they send it back to the teaching assistant. Uh, then they, the teaching assistant takes this file, the student's file, substitutes uh, it into the project, builds with it. Actually, I can pretend that I'm a very lazy student and this is the file which I submitted. Really should have put more effort into it, but, you know, other commitments. So this file builds, and then if you switch to test explorer mode, you will see that it has te 10 tests, one test per task. And if you do run all tests, uh, you will see that all 10 of them failed. Okay, I guess I'm not getting a good grade on this one. Um, so uh, the grading part can be automated even further because you can do this uh, copying over files and substituting them and running the tests on them. You can do all of this uh, from command line, uh, from a script, which is what our teaching assistants did. Uh, so basically the one thing you care about is how many tests passed. This is basically the grade out of 10. Uh, one thing that uh, we are considering uh, improvements on, well, obviously a lot of things can be improved. Like I'm, I want to do a refresher on the tasks, I want to do more tasks and maybe a little simpler ones because we got a lot of feedback on these materials, basically that the tasks are too hard, which I understand. I can err on the, hard, on the side of being too hard sometimes. Uh, one uh, big uh, theme in this was that uh, you notice that the katas come with the tests. If you are trying to solve them, you get your feedback immediately and you don't need to think about how to verify your code. When you have this uh, programming assignment, you only given the file with the tasks you're not given the testing harness. Uh, the reason why we're doing this uh, this way now is that the testing harness uses the correct solutions. A lot of times there is no other way that you can test the solution other than compare it with the correct one. And these solutions are all in the open. You can just look at this file, find your correct solution. We cannot really give out a graded assignment which comes with solutions built in. This is not how it's supposed to work. Uh, so this is why we had to withhold the testing harness for now. I think we can do better than this and package the testing harness um, so that it doesn't expose the student to the reference tasks but also doesn't require them to write testing harness upfront because Writing testing harnesses is not trivial and most students just cannot do it in the very first week that they have seen this whole quantum computing thingy. Um, 
I think this is it for the material that I had for you. Um, so, any questions? Uh, there is a mic coming up. The um, implementation uh, is hidden when uh, it, the cut is in the notebook rather than in the project, because you said like essentially the project which we are seeing here is the same that mm -hmm. we have in cut and open. Yeah, so when the cut comes in notebook format, like here, it's essentially a different front end for the same thing that you have seen in the assignment. So I can show you the repository where the cutters reside. Uh, GitHub repository, you have seen the links previously. And for example, if you look at the same uh, Grover's algorithm, there is the, the same solution file and project file, and it has the reference implementation file which has the answers. So uh, in the notebook format, they are hidden purely by virtue of uh, just not exposing people to this file structure. Just because Jupyter Notebook, you look at the notebook and it's, uh, it doesn't show you the rest of the files in that folder. But if you go to the repository, you can get access to these files. So for programming assignments, we cannot do the same thing. We need to package those files tighter, like build them up in a DLL at least, so that the, the students can still like disassemble the DLL and reconstruct what was inside for it. But honestly, if they do that, they deserve that grade. Thank you. Any other questions? I guess this is it then. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs>